Do you believe you can do this? Do you believe Christ can do this in you? Do you believe you can touch more lives? Do you think you can make a difference? Do you believe you can live a completely different life than you were living yesterday? I believe. Do you believe? I want to encourage you today to take a risk. Take a risk for God. And that's the point of today's message. The Holy Spirit is always in us and is always urging us to walk by faith and not by sight. To walk by faith, by an absolute trust in Him, to know that this is his world, that even what I see around me is crazy or chaotic or horrible, I will walk by faith and not by sight. That's what Pastor Jay Hewitt did in his story. Walk by faith. I'm not gonna curl up, flip over, I'm gonna run a uh, a triathlon. (laughs) Do you say run a triathlon? I don't even know. You do a triathlon, that's funny. Jonah called by God, go to Nineveh to the most dangerous person in the most dangerous city in the most dangerous country in the world and tell them to repent or die. God tells Moses, go to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh and tell him, release my people. God tells Peter, step out of the boat and walk on water. What? It's just a storm. God tells his disciples, go and heal the sick. And by the way, when you go, don't bring anything with you. These are examples of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of the prophets, the disciples, the believers, urging them to do things they thought they were impossible, to take what they feel is a huge risk in order to attain all that was set before them. We think of this, one way to think about it is absolute confidence in God's favor for you. There's a key word in our faith, it's grace. We use it a lot. In Greek, the word is charis. Everybody say charis. You guys, you guttural. Charis. Now, every translator, when they're looking at the Greek, has a choice between two words. They can choose grace or favor. In English, it technically means the same thing. I don't know about you, though, but for me, when I hear that word, it doesn't feel the same. Grace, the word grace feels, it's a good word, but it feels more like mercy or forgiveness. But another word, favor, I mean, that's the same word. And it's unmerited favor. It means you didn't earn it. You didn't do it. That it was earned for you. In other words, it's like saying, you're God's favorite. And we don't like saying that. But what if it's true? What if God sees you and his heart is overflowing with favor and love for you? This is what Jesus is experiencing in the baptism, by the way. When he goes down into the water and he comes up out of the water, you remember what the Holy Spirit says around him? You hear this voice that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? Jesus is actually experiencing God's grace in that moment. Not as forgiveness, he was sinless, but as favor, as life, as love. And we can have absolute confidence that God has more in store for you than mercy. He's got years of life, power, achievement, friendship. He's gonna use you to touch lives. He's gonna use you to change the world. He's gonna use you to impact your family. He's gonna use you to make a difference. But it's up to us to first start by taking a risk. Amen. And that brings us to the parable of talents. Now, last week we talked about this very weird parable I had never heard a sermon on from Luke chapter 16. Uh, Today, I'm going to preach on a parable I think of like maybe once a week. So it's also a strange one. It goes like this. We have some Bible experts in the house, I think. A man comes to three servants. He's a master of them all. And he gives, gives them each a portion of money. Now, the word we use here is talent. Talent is a measurement of gold. The NIV likes to translate it as a bag of gold, but I don't feel like that's a good translation. Here's why. A talent is 100 pounds. Now think of like one gold coin is an ounce, so one pound is 16 coins, so 100 pounds. Basically, a talent would be about 1,600 gold coins. That's a lot. It's like a, maybe a treasure chest. Today, what would that be? $2 million, $2.5 million of gold? That's one talent. So this man gives the first guy, remember how many gives him? Five talents. 
The second guy he gives, remember? Two talents. And the last one, the newbie, the rookie, what does he give him? He gives him, gives him one talent, that's right. And the Bible says that they are given gold according to their ability. Their ability to what? To make it grow. To make it increase. And so we know the story. The master leaves and he comes back and the guy with the five talents, what, does he do? what did he do? He doubled it, right? And the master goes, wow, you doubled it. I picked the right horse for this one. Way, hey, whoa. Five became 10. Well done, good and faithful servant. Then he goes to the guy with two bags. What did he do? He doubled it again. Whoa, another winner. 100% return on my money. He turned two bags into four bags. The final guy, bag of gold or treasure chest of gold, what did he do with it? He begins with a speech. Remember when we were kids and you give like you get in trouble and you like prepare your speech? He's ready, right? He says, Master, I knew you harvested where you never planted. I knew you were a hard man who had gathered in places you'd never sown. And you trusted me with this money. So I was afraid and I took it and I buried it and I protected it. And now here's your money back. What does he say to him? Now this is one of the few Bible verses where Jesus calls someone wicked. Wicked. He says, you wicked, slothful servant. Now that's interesting to me. Why? Because you were afraid. You said it yourself. You didn't even put it in a bank or get any interest or anything. You just buried it. You just buried your talent. You just took your talent and you put it in the ground. You just buried it. I could have buried it. See, this is the problem. The man did not understand the assignment. The assignment wasn't to protect the talent. The assignment was to grow it. How do the other guys grow? How do they grow their wealth? Right? How do they do it? That's a good question. We don't really know, but we can assume those guys grew their wealth by taking some sort of calculated risk. They certainly didn't stick it in the ground, and they certainly didn't put it in a bank. They did something with it. And I like to assume, too, that both of these guys, it's not their first rodeo. I like to think that these first two guys, they were given one talent originally, too, and they figured out a way to make it grow. And so they got an increase. They got two. And then they get five. And then now this last guy gets ten. Whoa. And what did Jesus say at the end to the guy with the one? Take his one and give it to the who? The guy with the ten. There's a lesson there, my friends. Here's the lesson. God is not looking to grow money. He's looking to grow people. God is not looking to increase money. He's looking to grab talent for his kingdom. And you can be that person. See, God is a God of do-overs. God can work with sin. He can work with that. He can turn it around. He can change it. God can work with people who give it a try and mess up. God is a God of reduce. It is at the core of the gospel, forgiveness, that we get do-overs. But here's who God will never call. Here's who God will never, ever call. God can call. God calls sinners. Did you know that? And God calls fools. And God can call crazy people. Trust me. I've seen it. I'm one of them. <laughs> he can make a crazy man sane. He can make a fool wise. And he can make a sinner a saint. But God will never call lazy people. When Moses, you know, when Moses is called, he's 80 years old and he's still out in the field and he's tending to his flock. Wow. When Elisha is called, he's out in the field and he's harvesting, the, you know, plowing his ground with his oxen. When Matthew is called, he's collecting taxes. When Peter is called, he's fishing. They're all doing stuff. It's not, doesn't may not seem important, but they're all doing something. They're all out there. They're in the story. They're in the game. They're playing their hand. They're making an attempt. They're taking a risk. They're doing something. And so this is the problem is that the, the, this curse of let it happen, this curse of sloth, it plagues us all. Oh, I've been, a, I have been plagued by it. So have you. And here's the, when we, it sounds judgmental, but it's not. It's a call to freedom. Very often we think 
it's too easy to assume that it feels like the spirit of sloth is about pleasure or having fun or letting your hair down. It's really not that. Sloth is rooted in fear. See, sloth is not uh, this, this thing of just red, rolling over and letting it happen. It's fear. It's fear of disappointing people. It's fear of becoming a doormat. It's fear of getting trapped. It's a wicked spirit. And it, 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 it gets us all sometimes. It gets us all. And don't, don't feel guilty about that. But be free from it. Because it's not the sloth that's getting you. It's underneath the sloth, which is fear. Fear. So how do we overcome our fear? And I only know, here, there's only one way that I know of that has worked for me to overcome this kind of resistance, this kind of fear that plagues us all the time, and that is to stand on the word of God and go. To just go, to get out the door, to take that first step, to take action, to get back in the game, to get back into my story, to go, to go, go. Here's a clue about scary stuff in your life. Although it is scary, and although it plagues us, and although it is like a blister on our heart, scary stuff is clarity. It's a signpost, because fear gives you clarity about where you're supposed to go. If you're tossing and turning every night about something, it's probably a clue that that's where God wants you to be or go, or something he wants you to do. See, I'm not scared of getting in a rocket ship and walking on the moon. That doesn't keep me up at night. I'm not rolling over worried about that. But you know who probably was? Was Buzz Aldrin. He probably felt that way. But I'll tell you some things I was scared of. I was scared of getting engaged as a 21-year-old man. That's young. And I was scared of planting a church. I was scared of having kids. I was scared of writing a book. Why? Because those are all things I was supposed to do at the time. Those things kept me up at night. And boy, what a, what a blessing it is when we learn that if there's something keeping you up at night, it means it matters to you. It means it's one of the most important things in your life. It means that it's probably where God is sending you to go. In all those cases, for me, there was something dark that was always pushing against me, saying, do it tomorrow, roll over and go back to sleep, go watch your favorite show, always something pushing against, against, against. I wish I could say I never gave in to that. I wish I could say I never buried a talent or buried a dream or let go of a person that was supposed to be in my life. I wish I never gave in to the let it happen spirit, but boy, have I, and so have you. We call it being human. But what we can learn from the pain of those mistakes is that I'll never do it again. That the good thing about being old is I know the price of doing that. That the older I get, I know the steep cost of letting it happen, of letting it die in the vine. See, the greatest risk in life is not taking any risk at all. As the late great Jim Rohn said, wait till they send you the bill for that one. Wait till they send you the bill for not investing in you. Wait till they send you the bill for not pursuing your dream. Wait till they send you the bill for not becoming all you could become. It's a steep invoice. It's a sharp accounting. It costs a lot to put your head in the sand, to roll over in bed and go back to sleep, to bury your talent in the dirt forever. Someone here needs to burn their ships. Someone here arrives on the shore of their dream or their goal or where God's supposed to send them, and when things get tough, they get back on the ship and go home. It's time to burn those ships for someone here. Someone needs to rent an Airbnb. It needs to be expensive. And they need to go there and finish their book. And they need to come back with a completed book because if they don't, they're going to get in trouble with their spouse because that was expensive. Somebody here needs to throw away their PS5. Somebody here needs to delete the apps on their phone. Somebody here needs to strike out on their own and become their own boss. Someone here needs to buy a plane ticket to that place you said you were going to go and they need to do it now. And when the person says, do you want a ticket that's refundable, what are we going to say? No, no refunds. You go or you lose. Somebody here needs to pay for the class because if you pay for it, you'll go. And somebody here needs to do something and set it up in a way that there's no going back. It's you and the Lord. Think about it. Think about it. 
Peter, called by God, holding his nets, all this equipment. Took him a lifetime to get it together. What does he do with his nets? Does he bring them with him? Does he keep fishing? No, he, he drops his nets. Elisha, dream comes true. He's called by Elijah to be his disciple. What does Elisha do? He's got all these oxen. It's like wealth in those days. He's got all this equipment to farm. What does he do? He chops up his plow into bits, uses it as a grill, slaughters the oxen, cooks it all, feeds it to the poor and his families and everybody, and leaves it all behind. We call that burning the ships. Or maybe we should say burning the oxen now, make it a little more Christian. Make a sacrifice and do the thing. Make a sacrifice and do the thing so that doing the thing sets you on a course that you can't turn back from. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Most of us have the first few bits on that triangle. We've all seen it. You remember what the one is at the very, very, very top? It's called self-actualization. What is that? Self-actualization means becoming all you could become. Finding out what you could have done. It means living a meaningful life. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to become who you could have been? It's not too late for you. Don't you want to know who you could have become? Don't you want to know? What if God shows us when we get to the end of our lives and he says, my beloved son, my beloved daughter, here's how you could have lived your life. Here's who you could have known. Here are the lives you could have touched. Here are the things you could have created. Here's the lives you could have changed forever. What if he says that? You know what? He won't. But he might tell you if you ask him. That would be a scary thing. It's not too late for you, my friend. People are living longer than they've ever lived. People are living healthier than they've ever lived. Don't let your mother, father, grandma, grandpa's words of, well, you're too old. Don't let that stuff get in your head. That sounds like a spirit of let it happen. 90's the new 40, you know. What's the, what's 40, I wonder then? What's 40? I don't know. It's not too late. It all starts with our thinking. There was a day when if you couldn't swing a hammer or swing an ax, life was pretty much over for you, but that's not true anymore. If you still got your wits about you, and you do, you wouldn't be listening to a sermon from me. <laughs> the Bible says, talks about the thoughts of our heart. As a man thinketh, or as a person thinketh, as a man thinketh in his what? And that weird? It doesn't say as a man thinketh in his head, as a man thinketh in his mind. It's almost like there's thoughts that we have up here, but then there's thoughts we have here. This is where God wants to change us today. You grow here, everything grows for you. You improve here, everything improves for you. Doesn't Jesus ask before he heals the blind man on multiple occasions, doesn't he ask, do you believe I can do this? He wants to hear them say it aloud. I believe. I believe. I believe. Do you believe you can do this? Do you believe Christ can do this in you? Do you believe you can touch more lives? Do you think you can make a difference? Do you believe you can live a completely different life than you were living yesterday? I believe. Do you believe? All right. I'll finish with this. Here are Bobby's faith killers. This is just my own observation, all right? Bobby's faith killers. I don't know if I framed that right. I'll find out later. Here are the things that are strangling your faith in your life, probably. At least they did for me. Number one is the news. Look, this is not a Bobby Shuler sermon unless I make somebody mad. Stop watching the news, on TV especially. Here's why. The news on TV especially is always based on fear. If it bleeds, it leads. It teaches you to blame the world for all of your problems. It, it trains you to look to the government, to look to this and to that, to look at all of the wars and all of the horrible things that are happening, and at the same time to be powerless to do anything. So it trains you into a way of thinking that says, I'm powerless. Well, Bobby, shouldn't we be informed? Yeah. Read the news and do it like once a week and do it on Substack. You know, or get a good newspaper. Remember those? Remember newspapers? No, nobody remembers. 99% <laughs> of TV news is chicken little. That's all I'm saying. All right? Number two, here's something that's killing your faith. A culture of apathy, doubt, and sloth. 
If this is a description of your friends, you need new friends. If this is a description of your church, you need a new church. If this is a description of your school, you need a new school. Trust me. You can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. Make a change. Here's number three, rigidity. Especially rigidity about the scriptures. You know us, we love the Bible here. We adore it. But the Bible, frankly, doesn't always make sense. I had a friend, a pastor actually, lost his faith over one scripture. It wasn't even one of the good ones. This was like one of the dumb ones. And I was like, no, it's just a mistranslation. He completely lost his faith over the stupid thing. And I was like, you should have called me, but it'd been like years like, ah, I already lost my faith. But that began with rigidity. Number four, I call it, did God really say syndrome? Remember what the snake says in the Bible? He tells that, you know, Eve to eat of the apple, what does she say? She's like, he goes, did God really say? She's like, you know what? It was like 10,000 years ago, I don't remember. <laughs> you remember? Did God really say? When I went to seminary, there's a lot of did God really say? There really, not a lot of standing on God's word, operating in faith, operating in power. Some of that's okay, but not a lot of that. It can become a poison after a while. In the university today in general, especially in the world of philosophy, it's so rooted in skepticism that uh, it, the people are getting dumber, actually. I, my old mentor, Dallas Willard, used to say, in the university, he was a philosophy professor at U USC, used to say, it seems like nowadays if people say, you just got to doubt everything. You can be dumb as a potato. This is his words, not mine. You can be dumb as a potato as long as you doubt. <laughs> All right. Uh, number five. Being indoors too much. Self-explanatory. Number six, not eating from the tree of life. Some of us are spiritually starving. See, there's two trees. There's a tree of knowledge and a tree of life. Right now we're eating from a tree of knowledge. We're learning. But there's this other tree, the tree of life. That's what we need to eat from. That is the prayer, the worship, the life of the spirit. We gotta eat from that tree or we're gonna starve spiritually. Finally, number six, seeing the worst in others. This is choking your faith. I know that doesn't, like, what does that have to do with faith? Well, because you need others to activate impossible goals in your life. And if you have a habit of not trusting people, of having no faith in people, of always seeing the worst in others, if they always have to prove themselves to you before you like them, it's gonna be very hard for you to have faith in God or to get around faith-filled people or to just give it a shot, or to give somebody a shot. When you see the worst in people, you're gonna get the worst from them, by the way. This is a good parenting rule as well. When you see the best, you're gonna get better than you would've gotten. Faith is important when it has to do with other people. Why? Here's what Jesus says. If two or three of you agree on anything, nothing will be impossible for them. Whoa, what if that's true? What if that's true? Well, anyway, even when you are alone, you're not alone. The Holy Spirit's inside you. He's with you. He's not left you. Take the Holy Spirit by the hand. Take a risk, my friend. There's a whole story and a whole world that lies before you. It's full of amazing things. I was finished with this last thought. Some of us here, we have nice ideas of God. We like God, but we're not at peace with God. Won't you be at peace with God today? He gave his son on the cross so that we could be at peace with him, forgiven of all of our sins, have a new start. He was raised from the dead that we could have eternal life in us and have the Holy Spirit. This may make zero sense to you, but it still rings true. You know what the Bible says? If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. If you're here today and you're listening to this and you're like, a lot of me doesn't believe in this religion or I don't understand it or no, but there's like this other part of me that kind of does believe I want to encourage you, give that seed of faith to God and see what he can do with it. Watch him change your life. You don't need to stand up. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to come down. You can make a decision right where you are. That's how I came to faith. And I, I literally, nobody knew, and I walked out, and that, my life wasn't the same. You can make that decision today. I want to encourage you to do that. And if you do that, would you text me the word hope to the number on the screen so we can pray for you? You don't have to do that either, but I just like praying for you. I want to encourage you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that life is an adventure and that you've given us the tools and even better, the favor to overcome what lies before us. 
We want to make every day count. We don't want to get through a day. We want to get from the day. We want to deliver, God, all that we can to the people that need us. We want to live the kind of life for you. We, we are not burying our talents, but we're able to show you the fruit of taking a risk, of walking by faith. No more fear, we pray, God. I speak and pray against the spirit of sloth, the spirit of fear, the spirit of let it happen. I condemn it to hell, and I ask in Jesus' name that you would raise to life my brothers and sisters right now through your Holy Spirit, a new mind, a new heart, fresh vision, new goals, new friends, new life, and we pray it all in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for watching Hour of Power on YouTube. We hope this message encourages you. Like and subscribe below for more encouraging content.